The Merchant and the Poor Man Once there was a merchant, he was extremely rich and had abundant merchandise and other property. His documents and letters reached all over the world and he had all the good things in life. Below his apartment lived the poor man. He was extremely poor and the circumstances were entirely opposite that of the merchant. Both of them lacked children. One time the merchant dreamed that people came and packed all his belongings in cartons. He asked them, what are you doing? They answered that they were taking all his things to the poor man. It enraged him that they wanted to take all he owned from his house. To lose his temper would not help because there were so many. They packed up everything he had, all his merchandise, wealth and possessions, and took it all to the apartment of the poor man. Nothing remained in his house save the empty walls. He was enraged. Then he woke up and realized it was only a dream. Though he saw that it had been a dream and thank God all his belongings were still with him, even so his heart pounded. The dream aggravated him sorely and he could not free his mind from it. Even before this, the merchant had been accustomed to pay attention to the poor man and his wife and to give them whatever he could. But now after the dream, he gave them even more attention than before. Nevertheless, each time they entered his home, his expression would change and he would shaken up at their sight due to the dream. Once when the poor man's wife entered, his face contorted that he became very distraught and disturbed. She asked, please forgive me for asking, but tell me, why is it that each time I come to your house, your expression changes so markedly? He answered her explaining the entire matter that he had had the dream described above and from that day his heart had been seized by fear. She asked him, did you dream this dream on such and such a night? She specified the date. He answered a yes and what of it? She told him, on the same night I also dreamed that I was very rich. People came to my house and packed up everything. So I asked, what are you doing? They answered to that poor man, that is to the merchant, who they were now calling poor. So there, why should you ascribe so much significance to your dream when I dreamed the same thing? Uh, upon hearing her dream, he became even more shaken and disturbed. It seemed to him from the dreams that all his wealth would be given to the poor couple and all their property would be given to him. He was very, very distraught. One day, the merchant's wife went traveling in her carriage on a day trip. She took some friends with her among them, the wife of the poor man. During the trip, a general passed by with his troops. They pulled to the side to let him pass. As he passed, he saw a woman in the carriage and commanded his men to take one of them. They went and took the wife of the poor man, threw her into the general's carriage and traveled on. Saving her now was impossible, for they had traveled on. Aside from that he was a military man, a general with troops guarding him. The general took her away to his country. She had fear of heaven and would not submit to him at all. She cried excessively, yet they would woo her and tempt her. But she had a firm fear of heaven. Meanwhile, the other woman returned from that trip, and it became known that the poor man's wife had been taken. The husband mourned and cried bitterly over his wife constantly. One time the merchant passed by the apartment of the poor man and heard him crying. He came in and asked him, Why are you crying so bitterly? He answered, And should I not cry, what is left for me? There are those whose wealth or children remain for them. I have nothing and now my wife has been taken from me. What is left? The merchant's heart felt for the poor man and his mercy welled up, seeing the bitterness he was enduring. So he went and did something wild. It was truly crazy and went and asked in which city lived the above general. He traveled there and did something very reckless. He went to the house of the general. There were troops stationed there. Then in the state of upheaval and unrest, he went forward recklessly, paying no attention to the soldiers. They were also shocked and dumbfounded, suddenly seeing a man in such tumult. So they also fell into upheaval. How did he come to be here? In the disarray they let him pass through. He went past all of them until he entered the house and came to the place where she was sleeping. He woke her and said, come. She saw him and was stunned. 
He said to her, Come with me now. She went with him, and again, they passed by all the guards unobstructed until they got away. Then he realized in disbelief what he had just done, and understood that very soon it would cause a great commotion. Indeed, there was a great uproar at the general's house. The merchant and the poor man's wife went and hid themselves in a cistern filled with rainwater, waiting for the commotion to die down. He stayed two days with her in the cistern. She took note of all his self-sacrifice for her and the suffering he underwent on her behalf. She vowed to the Lord that all the good fortune she would have, any fortune, greatness or success, that none of it should be withheld from him. And if he would want to take all the fortune and greatness for himself, leaving her as she was, he should be allowed to do so. But there was the problem. Who would serve as a witness? So she took the witness, the cistern as a witness. After two days, he left that place with her and went onward. He went with her further and further, but realized that also there they were looking for him. They went on and then hid together in a ritual bath. Again, she thought of the great self-sacrifice and suffering he was enduring for her. And again, she swore as before, and she took the ritual bath for a witness. They stayed there also for about two days and then continued on. Several times he hid himself with her in other places, like the first ones. Specifically, seven watery locations. They were as follows. The cistern, the ritual bath, a lake, a spring, a brook, a river, and a sea. In every place that they hid, she remembered his self-sacrifice and his suffering on her behalf. She swore as before and took the place where they were as a witness. They continued on and hid in these places until they came to the sea. Being that he was a trader and was familiar with the sea routes, he navigated the route back to his own country until he arrived at home with the poor man's wife. He returned her to her husband and there was great rejoicing. In the merit of having done this good deed and also resisting temptation when he had been with alone with, with the poor man's wife, he sired a son that year and she in the merit of having guarded her purity with both the general and the merchant also had a child, a girl. She was incredibly beautiful. Beauty that was beyond the realm of human appearance. For such beauty could not be found among people. People were saying she should be fortunate enough to survive to maturity. For a novelty remarkable as this has difficulty surviving. Her beauty and glory were very, very awesome. The likes of which could not be found in all the world. Many people would just come to see her, were stunned by her great and very exalted beauty, and would give her many gifts out of their affection. They kept giving until the poor man became very rich. The merchant came upon the idea of making a match between their children. Because she was so beautiful and such a novelty, he thought to himself that perhaps this was the intent of the dream, that they took from the poor man to him, and from him to the poor man. It was implying that their children would marry, and through this their estates would be merged together. One time, the poor man's wife visited him and he told her his idea that he wanted their children to marry, and through this the dream he had would be realized. She answered, I also had thought of this, but I did not have the boldness to speak of it, that my family would marry into yours. However, if you are willing, I am as well, and I would not withhold it, for I have already swore that all the good fortune I should have would not be withheld from you. Now the daughter and the son learned together under one teacher, learning languages and other traditional disciplines. Many would come to see the daughter and give presents until the poor man became very wealthy. Nobles came to see her and were very impressed. Her beauty was a great novelty among them, for it was not mortal beauty at all. Due to the awesomeness of her beauty, the nobles desired to arrange a match with the poor man. Any noble who had a son desired to arrange a match between them. However, it was not befitting them to marry into the family of a poor man such as this. So they were obliged to see to it that his status would rise. They arranged for him to serve the emperor. At first he was made a sergeant, and from there he rose higher and higher, for they attempted to raise his status quickly. He rose increasingly until he became a general, and the nobles wanted their families to become wedded to his. However, many were vying for this since a good number of nobles had been involved in raising him. Besides, he was not free to arrange a match with anyone, for the news had already spread that he had made a match with the merchant. The poor man who had become a general had more and more success. The emperor would send him to war and he succeeded every time. He raised him to an increasingly higher status and he continued to be very successful. Eventually the time came when the emperor passed away and all the people of the country concurred 
that he should become emperor. All the ministers convened and ruled that he be appointed emperor. He became the emperor, waged wars, and was very successful. He conquered countries. He would wage wars with success, conquer and move on until the remaining countries agreed to give themselves up to him willingly. They saw his formidable success, that all the beauty and fortune of the world was with him. Thus all the kings convened and agreed that he should be made emperor over the whole world. They gave him a letter written in gold. Now this emperor refused the marriage arranged with the merchant. It is not fitting for an emperor to marry with the family of a merchant. But his wife would not budge at all from supporting the merchant. The emperor saw that it would be impossible to make another match in the face of the one with the merchant. Especially seeing that his wife held the merchant in very high esteem. Thus he began to conceive plans against the merchant. At first he thought to bring him to poverty, and he tried with covert plans as if it was not he who was causing the loss. An emperor can certainly arrange such a thing. They caused him much loss until he declined and became destitute. Yet she, the empress, stood by him the whole time. Eventually the emperor saw that as long as the merchant's son was still living, it would be impossible to make any other match. So he attempted to bring down this son of the merchant. He thought of ways to bring about his downfall. He caused charges to come up against him and brought judges against him. And the judges understood that it was the emperor's will to eradicate him. They judged to stuff him in a sack and cast him into the sea. The empress was very downhearted by this. Yet even the empress cannot oppose the will of the emperor. So this is what she did. She went to the ones appointed to throw him into the sea, fell before their feet and pleaded with them exceedingly to spare him for her sake. Why? should he be sentenced to death. She pleaded with them a great deal to take someone else charged with the death penalty and throw him into the sea in place of this young man. Her entreaties swayed them and they vowed to her to spare him. And so they did. They threw someone else into the sea in his place and spared him, saying, go on your way, and he went. He was already a mature man and he went on his way. Before this, the empress went and called to her daughter saying, my daughter, no, that this son of the merchant is your true groom. She told her the whole story of what she had been through, how the merchant had sacrificed himself for her, had been with her in seven locations, and how she had vowed to God that all her good fortune would not be withheld from him, and how she had taken the seven places as witnesses, the cistern, the ritual bath, and so on. And behold, you are all my good fortune and success, so certainly you are this, and his son is your groom, but your father and his stupid Stupidity wants to murder him for no reason. I already struggled to save him and I succeeded that he was spared. Therefore, know that he is your groom and do not desire anyone else in the world at all. Her mother's word found favor in the daughter's eyes. She had also had fear of heaven and she answered that she would certainly act accordingly. She went and sent a letter to the son of the merchant who was still in prison, conveying the message that she considered herself to be his and that he was her groom. She included a map in which she drew all the places that her mother had hidden with his father. She drew the likeness of a sister in a ritual bath and she warned them directly that he guard this map very, very carefully and she signed her name at the bottom. Afterwards, as described before, the appointed officer seized another man in place of the merchant's son and spared him. He went on his way and he traveled until he came to the sea. He went in his ship and crossed the sea. Then a fair storm came and carried the ship to another shore where there was a desert. The power of the storm broke apart the ship, but the passengers were saved and they reached land. The land to which they came was a desert. Each one struck out in search of food. Ships did not ordinarily come there, being as it was a desert. So they did not expect that any ship would come to rescue them. They went in the desert looking for food and they all became dispersed each one in a different direction. This young man went through the desert, going on and on. Eventually, he wandered so far from the shore that he could not return. The more he wanted to return, the further away he strayed until he saw it was impossible to go back. He went wherever destiny would lead him, going on through the desert. He had with him a bow, which he used to protect himself from wild animals in the desert, and he found there things he could eat. He continued on and on until he came out of the desert and reached a settlement. There was water there and fruit trees surrounding it. He would eat from the trees and drink the water. He came to the conclusion that he would stay there the rest of his life. It would be hard for him to return to civilization. Who could tell if he would reach another place like this if he left it and traveled on? Therefore, he decided to stay there and live out the rest of his days. 
He had it well there, with the fruit to eat and the water to drink. Sometimes he would go out with his bow and shoot down a gull or a deer, giving him meat to eat. He also caught fish, for they were very good fish in the water. It pleased him to spend the rest of his life there. Now after the emperor carried out his decree on the merchant's son and was rid of him, for the emperor thought that the sentence had indeed been carried out on the merchant's son, and that he was no longer alive, he believed he was free to arrange another match for his daughter. So they began to discuss matches for her with various kings. They made her a fine courtyard and she stayed there. She chose daughters of noblemen as companions and she passed the time there. She would play musical instrument and other such things as was the custom. But whenever they offered a match to her, she answered that she did not want to talk, but rather that the prospective match should come there himself. She was an expert in music and she skillfully fashioned a place a suitor would come before her and sing a song of desire. In the manner that one in love speaks, words of affection to the one he desires. Kings came to suit her and they stood in that place, and each one sang his song. To some of them she sent an answer in the form of a song of affection, by way of her companions. To those to whom she was more attracted, she answered herself, raising her voice in song, also with words of affection. To some for whom she felt even more attraction, she showed herself to them face to face. She would reveal her face and sing words of affection. But to all of them she concluded, but the waters did not cover you. No one could understand her intent. When she revealed her face, they would collapse from the intensity of her beauty. Some of them remained weakened and some lost their minds from lovesickness. From the greatness of her beauty beyond imagination, even though they went insane or became permanently weak, more kings came to suit her, but to all of them she answered as before. Meanwhile, the merchant's son remained in that place. He fashioned for himself a dwelling place and stayed there. He also knew how to play and knew the art of music. He chose wood that was suitable for making instruments and made some for himself. From the sinews of the wild animals he made strings and he would sing and play to himself. He would take the letter that the daughter of the emperor had sent him and would sing and play. He would recall all that he had been through, how his father had been a wealthy merchant and now he had ended up here. He went and took the letter, made a mark in the tree, carved a hole in it and hid the letter there. He dwelled there some time. One time a great storm wind came and broke apart all the trees that had stood there. He could not recognize the tree in which the letter was hidden. While it was still standing, he had seen a mocking in its place, but now they had fallen. The tree with the letter had been jumbled with the other trees. There had been many trees there, so he could not recognize the tree. It was not realistic to split open all the trees to find the letter, for there were too many of them. He cried and was tormented by this a great deal. He saw that if he continued to dwell here, he would go insane from the overwhelming pain which he felt deeply. He decided that he must go on, come what may, for if not, he would be in great danger from the pain. He filled his pack with meat and fruits and went where destiny would lead him. But he left signs for himself in the place he was leaving. He continued until he came to a settlement. He asked, What country is this? And they answered him. He asked if the emperor was known in that country. They answered yes. He asked if his beautiful daughter was known there. They answered yes. However, it is impossible to be matched with her. He concluded to himself, seeing that it was forbidden for him to go there, that he should approach the king of the country in which he was now. He told the king his entire story, how he was her true groom, and it was on his account that she did not want to be matched with anyone else. Because it was impossible for him to enter her country, he was hereby giving over the signs in his keeping that in the seven watery locations, he advised the king to go over there and be betrothed to her and to pay him money in exchange. The king sensed the truth in his words, for it is impossible to invent something such as this. So the king looked upon the idea favorably. However, the king considered, if I bring the woman here, and that man is here, it would be so awkward. Yet to murder him would be difficult as well, for why should he be murdered for the favor he had done? Thus he decided to banish him to a distance of two hundred miles. The son was very resentful at being banished and recompensed for the favor he had done. So he went to the king of the place to which he was sent and told them the same story and gave him over the signs. To the second king he added a sign and urged him to travel immediately. Perhaps he could get there before the other. Even if he did not, he nevertheless had one sign more than the other king. This king thought as the other and sent the son 200 miles away. The son was also very resentful at this, 
So he went to a third king, and to the third king he added even more impressive signs. The first king immediately set out and arrived at the place of the emperor's daughter and sang a song. With wisdom he inserted in the song all seven places, that is the seven witnesses. However, according to the needs of the song, he had to change the order of the places as the rules of poetry demanded. He came to the spot where the suitors stood and sang the song. When the emperor's daughter heard the seven places, it was a wonder to her, only she found it hard to understand why the order was wrong. She assumed that perhaps he had used this order because of the poetic needs of the song. She concluded to, him, to herself that he must be the man, and she gave a sign that she was betrothed to him. Much happiness and commotion ensued upon hearing that she had found her soulmate, and they prepared for the wedding. In the midst of this, the second one arrived. They informed him that she was already betrothed, but he paid no heed to this, and that he had something to tell that would certainly change her. He went and sang his song, arranging all the places in the proper order, and he gave an additional sign. She asked him, how did the first one know? To tell the truth did not seem a wise idea, so he said he did not know. It was amazing to her, until she stood astonished. The first one also told the signs, and how could another man find this out? In any case, it appeared to her that the second one was a true soulmate, for he told her all the signs and in order as well. And as for the first, perhaps it was just the craft of the songwriting that had brought him to mention the places. However, she withheld a final decision. Now the son, after the second king had banished him, had felt offended, as described earlier, and gone to the third king, telling him the same story and adding more impressive signs. To the third he poured out his heart, explaining they had a letter on which was drawn all seven places. Thus the king should also draw for himself a map with all the places and bring it to her. The third also concluded that it would not be appropriate to bring her here if this young man was in the area, so he also banished him 200 miles away. The third king also ran there and upon arriving was told that there were already two who came before him. He said, even so, I have something to tell that will certainly sway her. The people had no idea why she had favored these two men more than all the others. Now this third one arrived and sang his song with signs more impressive than the other two. He showed the map with the signs drawn on it and she was dumbfounded. However, she could not take any action for the first one had also seemed like the right man and the son the second. Thus she said she would not believe anyone until one would bring her the letter with her own handwriting. Presently the son thought to himself, how much longer will they keep kicking me further and further away? He decided that he should go there himself, perhaps he could accomplish something. So he wandered about until he reached a place and that he said he had something to tell. He went and sang his song, gave increasingly accurate signs and he reminded her that they had learned together in the same schoolroom and the like. He told her everything, how he had sent kings to her, how he hid the king letter in the tree and everything he had been through, but she did not take him seriously at all. Certainly the kings whom came before all had explanations for why they did not bring the letter. She certainly did not recognize him for a long time had already passed, and she no longer wanted to depend on the signs, being satisfied with nothing less than the letter, for she had been sure that the first one was a groom, and likewise a second, and so she did not want to depend on anything except the letter. The son concluded that he should not delay here anymore and decided to return to his place in the desert where he had been. There he would spend the rest of his days. He wondered about attempting to reach that desert and finally he arrived there. Several years passed and he decided to remain there in the desert and pass the rest of his days. According to the value he ascribed to life in this world, he judged it to be good to pass his days there and he sat there and ate. Meanwhile, upon the sea, there went the murderer. He heard that there was a very beautiful woman in the world, and he thought to kidnap her. He himself did not need her, for he was a eunuch. Still, he wanted to kidnap her in order to settle to some king and receive great wealth in exchange. He started to put his plan into action. A murderer is a risk taker, so he took a risk, saying if it succeeds, it succeeds, and if not, not. What could he lose? He was accustomed to risks, as is the way of murderers. He went and brought a tremendous amount of very impressive merchandise. He fashioned birds out of gold with such artistry that they appeared to be truly alive. He also made stalks of gold and he positioned the birds on the stalks. This itself seemed a great novelty. 
The bird sat on the stalks without the stalks breaking. Although the birds were large, he also cleverly fashioned the birds so they appeared to play music. One of them would click with its tongue, another chimed the bell in its mouth, and another sang. It was all done with the sleight of hand, for there were people hidden in a room on the ship near the birds, and they produced all these sounds. Although it seemed as if the birds themselves were playing, the birds were manipulated by thin wires. It seemed as if they themselves did all the above. The murderer then traveled with all this to the country wherein was the emperor's daughter. He came to her city and positioned his ship on the sea, letting down the anchors and moored it. He presented himself as a major merchant and people came to buy expensive and abundant merchandise. He stayed there some time, approximately a quarter of a year, and people bought quality products from him. The emperor's daughter also to buy, desired to buy from him and sent to him to bring his wares to her. He sent her a reply that it was not his practice to bring his wares to the home of the buyer, not even to the daughter of the emperor. Rather, whoever wanted to buy had to come to him. As he was a merchant, no one had the authority to make him do differently. The emperor's daughter decided to go to him. When she went in the market, it was accustomed to wear a veil on her face so that men would not look at her, for they could collapse just from seeing her beauty. She went out covering her face, took several friends with her, and a guard followed behind. She came to the merchant, that is the murderer who appeared a merchant, bought merchandise from him and left. The merchant said to her, if you come again, I will show you products even more beautiful than these, real wonders. She returned home, went another time, bought from the merchant and left again. The murderer remained there for some time and she became a regular customer, coming and going freely. Then, on one of her visits, he opened up the room with the golden birds. He saw that it was an amazing novelty. The others, including the guard, also wanted to go on, but the merchant said, No, no, I will not show this to anyone, only to you, because you are the emperor's daughter. But to others, I don't want to show it at all. She went in alone, but he also went into the room and locked the door. Then he acted crudely, pushing her into a sack and stripping her clothes off her. With these clothes, he dressed one of the sailors, veiled his face, pushed him out and said, Go! The sailor had no idea what was being done with him. As soon as he exited the room with his face covered, the guarding companions did not realize what had happened and they began to walk away with him immediately, for they thought he was the emperor's daughter. He, the sailor, went with them, not knowing where he was at all. They arrived back at the room where the emperor's daughter had been accustomed to sit. When they unveiled his face and saw that he was a sailor, a great uproar followed. They slapped the sailor in the face and kicked him out, though he was not guilty because he knew nothing about it. Now the murderer kidnapped the emperor's daughter and he knew they would pursue him. He left the ship and hid with her in a cistern filled with rainwater until the commotion died down. He commanded the sailors on the ship to immediately cut the anchors and flee. Certainly the pursuers would chase them, but they would not fire on the ship, assuming that the emperor's daughter was on. But pursue they would, so he told them to flee immediately. And if they catch you, they catch you. What of it? This is the way of murderers, not to care what happens to them. And so it was, a great commotion arose. They chased after the ship, but did not find her on it. Meanwhile, the murderer hid with her in the rainwater cistern. He threatened her not to scream so no one should hear her. He said to her, I struggled hard to catch you and if I lose you, my life is worth nothing to me. Since you are already in my hands, if I should lose you and you are taken from me, my life would be worth nothing at all to me. So if you let out a scream, I'll strangle you immediately. I don't care what will become of me because I'm worth nothing in my eyes. And she was mortally frightened of him and did not dare scream. Eventually, they left and came to a city. They went on and on until they reached another place and realized that there too they were searching for her. He hid with her again, this time in a ritual bath. After a time, they left there too, and he then hid with her in other places until he hid with her in all the seven locations that the original merchant had hid with her mother. That is, in the seven witnesses. The seven types of water, the cistern, the ritual bath, the spring, etc. Then they came to the sea. He searched to find at least a small fishing boat to sail off with her. They found the ship and took the emperor's daughter with him in it. He himself did not need her, for he was a eunuch, but he wanted to sell her to some king and feared that she would be snatched from him. He, dressed, he thus dressed her in sailor's clothing, so she looked like a man. He crossed the sea with him. A storm came, and driving the ship to shore, smashing it. They found themselves 
on the same desert shore where the young man was. When they arrived there, being that the murderer knew geography well, he knew that this was a desolate place where ships did not come. Thus he had no need to fear from anyone. So he let her go freely and they stood up to search for food. She gained distance from him and she started to call out to her. But she stayed quiet and did not answer. She reasoned, if in the end he will sell me, why should I return to him? And if he should return and find me, I will tell him I did not hear him, especially considering that it is not in his interest to kill me, for he wants to sell me. So she did not answer him and went onward. He looked here and there and could not find her, so he continued, but could still not find her. It is safe to assume that wild animals ate him. Meanwhile, she continued on in search of food. She went on until she reached the place where the young man lived. Her hair had grown long and she was also dressed as a man in a sailor's uniform and they did not recognize each other. As soon as she arrived, he was filled with joy at seeing another person. He asked, How did you come to be here? She answered, I was traveling at sea with some merchant. She asked him, How did you come to be here? He answered, Also through traveling with a merchant. They sat there together. After the emperor's daughter was kidnapped, the empress mourned, beating her head against the wall at the loss of her daughter. She tormented the emperor with harsh words, accusing that it was through his stupidity that the young man had been lost, and now their daughter was lost. She was all of our fortune and success, she said. Now we have lost and what do I have left? She bared down hard on him with her words. Certainly he had his own deep sorrow at the loss of his daughter, and she only intensified it and this caused strife and anger between them. She would say accusing words until he became angry, that he decided to send her away. He set up judges and they sentenced her to exile and she was banished. After this, the emperor entered into war and was defeated. He blamed it on a particular general saying, because you did such and such, you lost the war. So he banished him. He fought more wars but was defeated and sent away more generals. He sent a good number of them away. The citizens of the country saw that he was acting strangely. First he sent his wife away, and then the general, so they decided why not do the opposite. Let's bring the empress back and send him away. And the empress will rule the country, and so they did. They sent him away and brought back the empress, and she ruled the country. The empress immediately sent for the merchant and his wife and brought them to live in the palace. The emperor who had been banished pleaded with those escorting him to let him free. In spite of everything, I was your ruler, and I certainly did good for you, so now be compassionate and let me go. I surely would not try to return to the kingdom, and you need not fear from me. Let me go, and I will at least be free the rest of my days. So they let him free, and he continued on his way. Several years passed. As he kept going until he came to the sea, he boarded the ship. But a storm wind drove his ship to the same desert shore mentioned above. Eventually, he came to the same place where the other two were sitting, that is the son of the merchant and his beautiful daughter who was dressed as a male. They did not recognize each other for the emperor's hair had grown and some years had passed and their hair had also grown. They asked him, how did you come to be here? He answered, they had traveled with a the merchant. They answered likewise, so that they sat together and ate and drank. They played instruments for all of them knew how to play. Now this young man was the most competent among them, for he had already been there for a long time before the others. He would bring them meat to eat, and for firewood they used trees which were more valuable than gold in settled areas. The young man argued with them that there was a fine place to spend one's life, and that even by the standards of prosperity in civilized places it was good to live here. They asked him, what good did you have in your life that you found it preferable to live here? He answered them and related his entire story. How he was a son of a merchant and how he had come to be here. He had had abundant good as a son of a wealthy merchant and here too he had abundant good. He proved to them that it was a good place to spend one's life. The emperor asked him, did you hear of a certain emperor? Yes, he answered. Then he asked him if he had heard of his beautiful daughter. He also answered yes to this. Then the young man began to feel rage. That murderer, he said. That is the emperor that they had spoken of. He did not know that he was speaking to the emperor himself. He spoke with anger and gnashed his teeth, saying, that murderer. The emperor then asked, what makes him a murderer? He answered, it is due to his cruelty and stupidity that I came to be here. How was that? The young man appraised that he had nothing to fear here. So he told him the whole story of what he had been through. It appears that previously he did not relate the whole story, only that he was a merchant's son. The emperor asked him, if that emperor were to come into your hands now, would you take revenge on him? 
He answered, No, for he was merciful. To the contrary, I would provide for him as I am providing for you. The emperor began to sigh and groan, how bitter and unfortunate for that emperor upon hearing that his daughter had been lost and he himself banished. Then the young man added, because of his cruelty and his pride, he destroyed himself and his daughter, and I was sent there. It was all because of him. Again the emperor asked him, if he came into your hands now, would you take revenge? The young man answered, no, to the contrary, I would provide for him as I am providing for you. Then the emperor revealed himself and admitted that he was that emperor and told what he had been through. The young man fell upon him, hugging and kissing him. And she, the emperor's daughter, who was also there, only that she appeared as a man, heard all that they had said to each other. Now the young man had a daily routine. Each day he would search in three trees in search of the letter and he would make a mark on them. There were thousands upon thousands of trees there, so he mocked those he had checked, so that the next day he would not check them again. He held on to the hope that he just might find the letter. When he would return from searching, he would come with tear-strained eyes, for he had cried from searching and not finding. The others asked him, What are you looking for in those trees, and why do you come back with tears in your eyes? He answered them, telling him, telling them the whole story, that the daughter of an emperor had sent him a letter and he had hid it in these trees and a storm wind had come and now he was searching, for who knows, perhaps he would find it. They said to him, tomorrow when you go, we will go with you, maybe we can find the letter. And so they went with him and the emperor's daughter found the letter in a tree. She opened the letter and saw that it was a handwriting. She thought to herself, if she reveals herself to him then and there, removing her garments of disguise and revealing her fine beauty, he might faint and die. So being that she wanted things done properly, she simply brought him the letter and told him that she had found it. He immediately fainted. They revived him and brought him back to health and there was great rejoicing amongst them. Then the young man said, What use is this letter to me now? How can I find her? Surely by now she is with some king. So why do I need the letter? I'll spend the rest of my life here. He returned the letter to her and said, Take this letter. You go and marry her yourself, for she appeared to be a male. She agreed to go, but asked him to go with her as well. She said, I will certainly marry the beautiful woman, and whatever good that comes to me, I will share with you. That is, the emperor's daughter said to all this to the young man, pretending to be a man. The young man saw that this was a wise man, that is, the emperor's daughter, who is disguised as a man, and he would surely win the beautiful woman. So he agreed to go along. The only problem that remained was the emperor, for he feared to go back to the kingdom. The emperor's daughter asked him to come back with them, saying that if she were to marry his daughter, he would no longer need to fear, for his good fortune would return, and he can go home again. The three of them went together, hired a ship, and came to the kingdom where the empress ruled. They came to the city where she lived and stationed the ship there. The emperor's daughter thought to herself, if I reveal myself immediately to my mother, she might die. Therefore she sent a letter saying, there is someone who has information about her daughter. Then she went there herself and described everything that had happened to her daughter, the whole story. After that she said, and she is here as well. And then she told the truth, I, I am your daughter. Then she informed her that her groom, the merchant's son, was also there. However, she stipulated that she did not want to marry unless her father, the emperor, was retained to his position. Her mother was not at all pleased with this, for she was very wroth with him for having created all this trouble. Nevertheless, she was obliged to fulfill her daughter's request. They ran to fetch him, but he had disappeared. Then her daughter told her that he was also there. The wedding took place and the happiness was complete. The couple took over the kingdom and the royalty and they ruled over the entire world. The old emperor no longer had any true greatness because it was all his fault. The merchant though had very much greatness because he was the father of the real emperor.